always good when you get the high sign, right? <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Georgia Logistics uh, <coughs> Summit and the uh, opportunity session for food. My name is Ray Curtis. Uh, I'll be your moderator this morning uh, for this session. I am with uh, Delta Airlines, uh, the cargo side of the business. I am the vice president of sales. I've been with Delta for five years. Prior to that, I was with uh, United Cargo and with Northwest Cargo before that. So I've been in the industry for 30 years. Uh, clearly, the perishable side of the business is a, is a key component of the air freight industry, and we were asked to uh, participate because of that aspect. Uh, as I often like to say, we are the fresh and fresh fish, and so here we are, and uh, again, welcome. <clears throat> You know, just to briefly give you an overview about uh, Delta, uh, we are a leader uh, in an improving industry. Uh, the industry is becoming more healthy. Last year, we generated $1.6 billion in income, uh, a 30% increase over 2011. Uh, we grew our unit revenues. We had top-tier operational performance. So again, when you're moving perishable goods, it's vital and it's critical that we're operating an on-time airline. Uh, we've outpaced the industry for a second year in a row. Uh, with many of our aspects. Uh, we've reduced our debt by over a billion dollars. We're approaching uh, just about $10 billion in debt. When Northwest and Delta came together, we had over $17 billion in debt. So uh, having a healthy company and being a provider to the industry is very, very important. And again, we uh, provided an 11% return on invested capital. Uh, we need to have uh, shareholders continue to invest in our company so we can continue to grow. Uh, we have a very leading presence across the globe. As you can see, we're the largest U.S. carrier. We're number one across the transatlantic. Uh, we're number one into Africa, pioneering as U.S. carriers going into the African market. Number three in Latin America. Uh, we are number one to Japan and number two into the Asia market. We have very strong financial momentum. Uh, <clears throat> we are on track to achieve our first profitable quarter here in 2013 uh, since 2012, so it's really an indicator of the challenges that the industry is in, uh, facing. Uh, we've made massive investments in our network, our operations, our product, and uh, driving uh, revenue growth and corporate share gains. Our structural cost, we're at doing everything that we can to keep it down so that we are a, a provider uh, that consumers are able to turn to and make cost-effective purchases, and having free cash flow and a balance sheet that is very supportive of debt reduction, uh, shareholder returns. You know, we are taking a different approach in the industry. Uh, the way that we view it is, is uh, it starts with our employees. Uh, if we have the best employee relations in the industry, uh, they're going to take uh, very good care of our customers. Customers have choice in the industry. Uh, we see ever-increasing opportunities for passengers to fly in the U.S. More international carriers are serving the airport here uh, at Hartsfield Jackson. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if our customers continue to purchase uh, our services, whether it be for air cargo needs or whether it be for uh, their own needs for traveling, uh, then we'll continue to grow, and it's a great investment for our shareholders, providing them uh, solid returns. So it's all interconnected on, on how we operate in that regard, and we believe that we take a different approach. Uh, Delta has been renowned uh, through uh, many, many years for two things, great customer service and great employee relations, and that continues. Uh, on uh, through our 80 years of history. As it relates to the air freight industry, if you look at the uh, regional growth projections, um, we have not seen a return to pre-recessions levels due to weakened financial systems and uncertainty in both the advanced and emerging markets. I think we're all seeing that. You can see uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, relatively uh, low growth, 1.9%. Asia Pacific continues to be the powerhouse of where economic activity is occurring uh, in the world. Uh, <clears throat> it has come down from some of its peaks. We have seen that. Uh, obviously, the Middle East and North Africa, there are definitely challenges and uh, tensions that are occurring over there, some instability, if you will. Uh, Latin America continues to see uh, unprecedented growth, if you will. 
um, uh, for an area with the traffic coming in, uh, and that continues to remain strong even during the recession. Uh, traffic coming from Asia going into Latin did not see anywhere near uh, the decline in business that uh, other markets did. And you know, clearly, I think we're all aware of uh, the challenges that are taking place uh, in the EU, and you can see the effects that it is having on that. It, you know, obviously, if uncertainty is decreased, the recovery could turn out to be stronger than what is being anticipated. Uh, but again, if we were able to predict that, we probably all wouldn't be sitting in this room and sitting on our own private island somewhere. But hopefully we can <clears throat> see return to uh, you know, much more economic uh, growth and economic strength, and it's going to serve all of our industries. Um, you can see uh, freight traffic growth uh, is on the, the left uh, slide here. A um, lot of volatility over the last four years. Uh, we saw the, the very strong upsurge. You were able to see that in the chart with the inventory recycling cycle that, uh, cycle that happened in 2010. Uh, since then, freight uh, volumes worldwide have pretty much remained flat. Uh, the forecast for this year is uh, anywhere between a 1% and a 2% uh, growth of uh, air freight in, in the world. Uh, the perishable side of the business is clearly one that we do see continued growth. <clears throat> You know, another aspect that we're facing is overcapacity. Uh, you can see on the chart on the right, uh, the red uh, bars are freighter, uh, all cargo aircraft, and the blue bar is passenger aircraft. So as more and more passenger new aircraft come online, uh, they're bigger, uh, the A380, uh, the 777-300. Uh, as an example, has 42 positions in the lower hold of that aircraft, while a 747 only has 30 positions. Uh, a 777-300 holds uh, 100 less passengers than a 747, and you have 12 more positions. So it is a very cargo-friendly aircraft, and that's why you're able to see that there is that increased capacity, and you're seeing more and more competition uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, it is putting pressure on yields in the business. Um, and we don't see any let up in sight at this point uh, with that increased capacity coming into the market. When it comes to you know, focus on food and logistics, uh, it is a key component for Delta Cargo. It represents approximately or 10% of our uh, annual revenue. We are a billion dollar business. Uh, in Atlanta, we have a 45,000 square foot perishable uh, facility. Um, and we also have perishable facilities across uh, key locations in the U.S. as well as throughout the world. In 2012, we transported over 5 million kilos of asparagus from Lima, Peru. So if you go to uh, Kroger or any uh, Whole Foods or any of the other stores that are out there, uh, I am sure that if you look at that, it may have well been asparagus that was flown in on Delta planes. Um, you know, despite the challenges that we are facing in the industry, we do see significant growth in the perishable business, whether it be uh, for the salmon that is coming out of the Alaska market that is being flown uh, down into the U.S., whether it be uh, Eastern Atlantic bluefin tuna that is coming, uh, coming out of uh, the New England area and being shipped into Japan, as well as tuna from Saipan, uh, Guam, Palau, going up into the Japanese market, uh, Santiago, Chile. Uh, the Chilean salmon, they were finally able to eradicate the disease that had been impacting their ability to export salmon. Uh, so that is now coming back into the market and we're seeing that. Uh, whether it be fruits and vegetables coming out of Spain, it, it is becoming an ever increasing uh, aspect of our business. Uh, we are not, uh, as consumers, uh, we are definitely looking to have products year round. And we're not necessarily eating products based upon seasonality. Uh, we're definitely seeing some of that occurring in the European theater. Uh, with regard to green and other aspects because they do view fresh goods being flown in as, uh, as you know, providing two uh, CO2 emissions. But again, for the most part, you know, we are, as a consuming uh, aspect, wanting to be able to eat tomatoes year-round. Uh, and it isn't because it's out of season where we are. So uh, again, it continues uh, to grow for us. Uh, at Latin America, whether it be seafood or other aspects, it's continuing to grow. And uh, at the end of the day, experience makes you stronger for a, a stronger tailwind. So uh, our next speaker uh, coming up will be...
I'm sorry, Ken Esser. Uh, Ken is with CSM Bakery. He is the Director of Logistics. Uh, he is of customer service and logistics, excuse me, at CSM Bakery Products. Mr. Esser became responsible for customer service, demand planning, transportation, and warehousing for the U.S. operations of CSM after he joined the company in 2012. Good morning. Great, thank you. <laughs> Normally I have to ask a second time to get a reply. <laughs> well, I'm with, uh, I'm with CSM Bakery Products North America. Um, we're a bakery products and a bakery supply manufacturer. So our customers include in what's re what we refer to as in-store bakery or the retail side of the business. We also have food service and we also have what we refer to as industrial. And industrial would be selling bakery ingredients to another company who would then make a cake out of it. Um, it's, it's an interesting, having been involved in the food industry most of my life, I tend to be one temp or another, but we're sitting here in our business and we have both ambient and frozen product, but even within that, we've got product that's protect from heat and protect from freezing. So we're running the whole gamut from that standpoint. Uh, the company, and many of you in the Atlanta area may have heard of Brill, HC Brill, which is one of the legacy companies. We're actually the merger of a lot of different companies. Brill in Atlanta traces their roots back to 1928, but we have different parts of the company that trace back into the 1800s. And the, the things were, it, it's an interesting thing in that pretty much everybody in this room has consumed our product. You just didn't know it. <laughs> because we don't have a brand out on the shelf that you would recognize. But we do icings, we do cakes, we do muffins, and we do cookies, what we refer to as cookie pucks. Um, which are, we, we make the cookie and then it's baked in the store. We have 12 plants around the country. Um, we have uh, the ones in blue are our dry ingredients plants, and the ones in red are bakery manufacturing facilities, which those facilities are primarily shipping frozen product. Atlanta is our largest production complex. We have both a dry and a frozen plant here and our corporate office. So as I, as I look at logistics, I, I've been in logistics a long time, and I think I, I see logistics evolving. And I, I think everyone agrees with that. There's been a lot of changes over the years. One of the things I do see, though, is that it's not just about booking a truck, negotiating a 3PL contract. You have to be very aware of what's going on with your company today. You have to be very involved with your sales group, understand where they're going, and understand how that impacts what you're doing in your position and, and how logistics is impacting what they're trying to do. At the same token, you have to know a lot more about the customers. You have to understand what's driving their business, how logistics is supporting it. And, and in our case, we have to understand differentiation. Uh, we're, we're not what's referred to as center aisle. We're, we're not a can of corn. We're not a box of corn flakes. We're on the outer rim of the aisle, we're out where the bakery is, and that's where the stores differentiate themselves from each other. And so we have to understand that differentiation. You'd be surprised how many different SKUs we have for chocolate chip cookies. You know, and there's different sizes, and some have chocolate chips, and some have chunks. And so you have to understand some of that differentiation, how that applies to the customers, and how logistics contributes to that. So it's understanding what we are, and, and we're basically two things at CSM. We're indulgent and we're celebratory. So when you're buying our products, you're either indulging or you're celebrating some event like a birthday or as this little boy is, so. <laughs> so when we were asked to be part of this panel, Paige asked us, what keeps you awake at night? Well, the first thing that came to mind is my daughter's college tuition bill. <laughs> but since that's really not logistics, <laughs> I, I think from my standpoint, there's a couple of things I look at that are really a challenge right now. I, I think LTL is a challenge for us on the frozen side. You know, if, if you look at the dry side LTL business, there's just dozens and dozens of carriers. The freight moves on a daily cycle. Frozen and, and temp control in general is very different. It, it's generally a once a week cycle. Um, transit times tend to be very long. And so there's, there's just a service issue there that can be very difficult to deal with. And, and quite often, you're not going to meet the customer's expectations in that environment. So, it's, so the LTL is a bit of a struggle. And there's, 
there's not a lot of volume going LTL, so it's also a struggle to really try and impact that. There, there was some discussion earlier today, too, about regulation. And I think especially in the food industry, the regulations, there, it, we're seeing a lot of issues there. You know, of course, CSA 2010 was out. There's a reference to hours of service. Um, here we go again. Who knows what they're going to be this time. But when you start to look at transportation, you're also seeing things like the Sanitary Food Transportation Act. You're seeing the Food Safety and Modernization Act. Uh, you're, you're seeing trucking companies in the industry, which you know historically has been regulated by the, by the federal and the state DOTs, now having to deal with USDA, US Health and Human Services, Homeland Security. There's, there's various state agencies that are now jumping into the mix and regulating transportation. And you know, being here in Atlanta, it becomes difficult to under you know to keep track of all that when you've got a, a plant network that's spread across the country. One of the biggest issues that's come up in our area uh, this year is the California Air Resource Board, and I don't know if everyone here has has heard about that. They they have regulations out that regulate the pollution coming from the reefer unit on a trailer. Well, they've gone back and they did some looking to see where the issues were, and they realized that the issues weren't with the private fleets, the issues with the, were with the for hire carriers. And so they've passed regulations out there right now that will actually hold the shipper and receiver responsible if they hire a carrier whose unit doesn't meet the CARB law. And so just a few weeks ago, they find a carrier over $300,000, they had 32 units, they fined them $300,000 for violations of the air, air laws, lowered it to 200, waived the other 100 based on their agreement to go and get new reefer units. So as a shipper, you know, we're looking at the situation where even though I'm sitting here in Atlanta and I could book a load to California, I could get fined $10,000 if that carrier's equipment doesn't meet the standards for California. So we're also asked what makes us excited. One, one of the things I see is sustainability. There's been a real move towards uh, sustainable packaging, but a lot of the sustainability is now moving into the transportation logistics area. You talk a lot about how you can make your warehouse green, um, different things like lighting and, and different processes along the way. Uh, transportation, the Smart Way program is out there. And, and part of what I'm seeing now is that our, our customers have traditionally come back to us in the food industry and wanted to help do things like reduce packaging, reduced waste, reduced packaging. They're now taking the next step and coming back and asking us how we're impacting other aspects of sustainability. I'm, I'm getting word from a few of our customers that in the next two to three years, they're going to be expecting us to only use smart way certified carriers on their loads. And so part of what's driving us sustainability is our own value for doing it, but our customers are driving us there too. And that's going to flow through the supply chain. And I'm going to go back and we'll at one point probably only be able to use carriers that are Safeway certified. Or, sorry, Smartway certified. I apologize. <laughs> um, the other thing is I see a lot of standards changing in the industry. It used to be we would just have the, the AIB standards. But today we're getting a lot deeper in the standards and a lot of the quality standards that have been applying to food are now going deeper into the process and dealing with the supply chain. Uh, looking at warehousing processes, in, in my situation, looking at how we monitor temperature in transit and documenting our process for that, showing how we're going out and making sure the process is being followed from shipment all the way out to delivery. And so part of our certification in our particular company, we're BRC certified. Uh, there's a number of other certifications in the food industry that are similar to that. But part of that certification is actually documenting our processes. And when, when they come in and do an audit of one of our plants, they at the same time audit my own transportation processes relative to that. So a couple of quick thoughts. Um, we open for questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, 
At this point, I would like to introduce Mike Hardy <clears throat> from Whole Foods. He is the distribution manager, and he is the South Distribution Facility uh, Team Leader for Whole Foods Market. Mr. Hardy, with 20 years of industry experience, joined Whole Foods in 2006 and has led the company in converting its distribution fleets to biofuel and spearheading recycling and composting programs uh, for all the stores in the South region. See my whole presentation here. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to appreciate Paige and his team for allowing me to be here uh, to talk about food and Whole Foods and some of the things that we do that makes Whole Foods different from our competitors and some of the things that we do that, that makes me love to work for Whole Foods. I run a small distribution center that's serving 26 stores in the South region that makes up six states. We are on an aggressive growth path and plan to have 50 stores, yeah, 50, uh, uh, in the, within the next five years. Our next store will be coming in on, in Savannah on, uh, in August of this year. Uh, cool things that we do that you might not know about. Uh, I've been with Whole Foods for almost seven years, and every year that, that I've been there, Whole Foods has bought enough green energy wind credits to offset our entire company's electrical bill for every store in the country. Uh, we've recently uh, partnered with uh, the Marine Steward uh, Ship Council, so uh, we're providing sustainable, healthy choices uh, for seafood and other, other things that you eat and consume. This is pretty cool, you know, our animal uh, uh, welfare program. Uh, you know, every, everything on this planet has a, a, a finite life, but we want to live the best life we possibly can prior to our, 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 our end, let's just say. So uh, we do believe that uh, animals that are treated properly, uh, raised properly, and processed properly are happier, better animals, and provide a better product. This is actually something that we, we brought on last year uh, around Earth Day, but now you can go to, uh, into our stores and our, our grocery aisle and look at our cleaning products. We actually have a new EcoScale rating uh, you know, uh, to see how clean a product is or how, or how uh, non-clean it is. So, uh, the red would be something maybe that, that has some degreasing <coughs> agents in there that, that works pretty good, and the, the greenest would probably just be water and elbow, uh, elbow grease. <clears throat> uh, here's some pictures uh, uh, of some of our products. I mean, we're all about local. Yeah, we might get some, uh, some clementines or something from Spain, but I'd rather have a local asparagus right out of Social Circle, Georgia, in our Georgia stores. But uh, our whole trade foundation where we partner with growers across the world where we pay them a fair price for their products and services uh, and, and pass those goods on to the consumers. Here's a cool shot. This is a, a picture of our new LEED certified gold store in, in Raleigh. For, uh, those in construction know LEED is an organization that, that uh, gives you accreditations for being green. So this is a gold. You can kind of see on the side that's a cistern. It's really cool. It's collecting rainwater off the, off the roof is one of their things that they use there. Uh, and that's flushing their toilets in gray water. Uh, they also have all kind of LED lighting and uh, different types of energy savings. This is, this is a, a, sh a shot of our core values. Uh, Whole Foods was founded 31 years ago uh, by some, some, some hippies out in Austin, Texas, uh, with a food, uh, just a basic uh, health food store. But uh, these are things that we live by. Uh, we support team member happiness and excellence is a huge one for me. And then providing a win-win with our suppliers and, and uh, partners. Just some of our beliefs, uh, sustainable agriculture, live environmental practices, community citizenship, and integrity in all of our business dealings. This is an actual shot of our distribution center up in Brazelton. It's gorgeous. I love working up there in the country. Uh, some cool things we've done up there. This is when we had some snow a couple years back. But uh, because we, we're out in the country, we have deer and other wildlife, we actually applied for and we, we are a, a certified wildlife natural habitat. We have bird feeders, this and that, so it's pretty cool. My distribution center is not a LEED certified green building, but we did put some green goodies in there. Um, all of our hot water is heated by solar, solar thermal. Uh, all of our monument signing around the building is powered by solar power. Probably the coolest thing we're doing there is we're collecting rainwater off our building too 
and we're using that to pump back out and irrigate our grounds. So we have no municipal irrigation there. Here's a picture uh, when the distribution center was being built, and you can actually see the underground cisterns. It's pretty big, but the, the gutters just are feeding that thing right off the roof, and then we pump that back out. And you see our flagpole being lit by our solar light. Uh, being in distribution and logistics, we're able to help facilitate Whole Foods recycling efforts. Um, all of our stores send back their old electronic goods back to the distribution center where we collect them. Once we have a load, we have them certified e-recycled. This is another cool thing we got. That's wax cardboard. So most of your uh, iced down vegetables are shipped in wax boxes. And we, we sell a product called Envirolaw, which is an enviral friendly fire law, basically made out of uh, wax cardboard, and they're located in Fitzgerald, Georgia. So our stores send this back, we bail it up, we take it down there to uh, Envirolog, and then we, we sell those Envirologs in our stores. So that's a closed loop. A couple shots here of our break room. I love the, the picture with the can. Uh, our maintenance guy was tired of team members putting their uh, plastic bottles or whatever in the aluminum can, so he developed something that I guarantee you nothing can fit in there except for <laughs> aluminum cans. So. Creative, eh? Uh, this is a, a cool program. Uh, Whole Foods has partnered with the Preserve Company. Preserve manufactures like hairbrushes, uh, combs, toothbrushes. It's all made out of number five plastic. Um, so customers can bring back their number five plastic to Whole Foods. We recycle it back. We bail it up and we ship it back to Preserve. They melt it down, uh, turn it into products, and then we turn around and sell it in our store. So it's another closed loop. And that big green machine that you're looking at, that's actually our composting monster. So we have stores sending back their food residuals to us, and we divert those from the landfill, and we work with several composters in the, in the area uh, to turn that back into compost, and we do sell that in our store as well. Here's some pictures of what number five plastic uh, looks like. And does anybody know what number five plastic is? You know, my girlfriend thinks all plastic can just mix it all together and melt it down. It, it doesn't work that way. So number five is basically your yogurt, yogurt cups and your margarine tins. And it's a difficult uh, number to recycle. And you see some of the bales up there in the racks. That's actually yogurt cups baled into bales. And it takes a lot of damn yogurt cups to make a bale. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, this is something we did every year. We have a celebration around Earth Day. Uh, it's April 22nd, so this is last year, actually. We, were, we planted 10 fruit trees on our property. Uh, we let that fruit hit the ground, and then we let the deer eat it. Um, here's, our, here's, a, here's a shot of our summer garden from last year. Uh, team members plant the garden on our grounds, and then we all work it, and then we get to share in the yield. And uh, the picture of the, the conference room, that is my conference room, but that's team members in there. Whole Foods is a very bottom-up, not top-down, but very bottom-up driven company. So they're in there having a meeting, and they kind of self-direct themselves. Uh, here's a picture of our certified uh, natural wildlife habitat. It was way cool. So there you see a birdhouse. We have a bird feeder. We have natural wildflowers pl uh, planted up there. Some of the things we do with our local communities, uh, once or twice a year we partner with the Georgia Recycling Coalition and do a big uh, shoe drive for Souls for Souls. We also uh, have tours and, and whatnot, and I, I love it when we get the little kids come through there. This is the Daisy. You know, I thought Brownie was about as small as you can go in Girl Scouts, but no, they got daisies, and these are little girls. Uh, this is us giving back to the community of Brazelton. We uh, were in their fall uh, parade uh, a few years ago. This is our float recycling theme. You know, we want to make a difference in the county that we, we serve up there in Brazelton. Um, team members uh, work with the local DFACs up there. We've done that for four years in a row and provide presents for their kids at Christmas. Here's another little tour. You know, we support our environment, and we're leading by example. This is the highway behind our distribution center. Uh, we adopt that road, and we, we keep it clean. And we do have trucks come in there, and everybody knows truckers sometimes uh, don't have a trash can nearby, so they, they might possibly litter, so we, we pick that up. And then sometimes you have to give back, right? This, this is our team members actually uh, coming out to work that street on their off day, uh, giving back. This is a, a team bill we went on. We went and toured some, some local farms, local producers, and uh, this is a picture of 
of a pile of compost. I asked that, that farmer, uh, you know, where he got that, and, and he bought it from the place we're sending, sending our food residuals. So, in theory, he's putting compost back on his crops that he could have come from his crops from the previous year. This is really cool. We got a new biofuse diesel fuel tank uh, on our yard. Uh, we're running B20. Uh, probably the neatest thing that we're doing is the biodiesel that we're burning is made from our store spent grease. So a few years ago, retail businesses had to sell that grease to, or have it rendered or whatever. Now people are stealing it. But uh, you can, you can uh, turn that stuff into biodiesel and lower your carbon footprint. That's yours truly filling a truck with some biodiesel. Uh, we have systems where we periodically go, go in and do uh, dynamic reroutes. Uh, optimizing our, our uh, fleet's capacity. Uh, the last reroute we did, we uh, reduced our emissions by 42 tons per month. <clears throat> you know, green, we say it's in our DNA, it's in our core values, or we have a chem chem chemical-free landscape up there was another reason why we were able to obtain that accreditation. But the picture beside us is actually, that's John Mackey in the, in the yellow coat. He's our founder and uh, CEO and he's got a great new book out called Conscious Capitalism. Uh, and if you haven't read that yet uh, and want to get to know uh, a little bit more about Whole Foods and his philosophy, I, I highly recommend it. And then here's finally, here's some of the uh, recycling that our, my distribution team helped uh, our region uh, do. I won't go through all the numbers, but we diverted a lot of food residuals, almost 4 million pounds uh, that year. Uh, cardboard, all the stores are sending that back, 5 million pounds. The wax cardboard going into the Envirologs, coming back. Clear film, our store sends all that back. Just like yogurt cups, clear shrink wrap takes a lot to make a bale. Uh, but there, there you see some of the things we did. We had a great year last year and uh, looking forward to uh, this year as well. Thank you so very much.